Welcome to First Words, a podcast presented by the First United Methodist Church of Florence. Today's message is brought to you by Youth Director Mac Nolan. Today is Christ the King Sunday, also called the Reign of Christ Sunday, and this is the end of our Christian year. After this, we'll move into the season of Advent, and we'll begin to look more deeply into the life and witness of Jesus, but we end our year remembering Christ as King. In a world where we pledge our loyalties to various things aside from Jesus, Christ the King Sunday is a celebration that allows us to refocus on why we're in the world, to be a people of love. On this day, we are reminded of the reign of Christ, and we declare that our ultimate allegiance is not to a nation, not to an ideal or a dream, not to a public figure or celebrity or politician, but to the person of Jesus. Our faith, in its most basic form, is about a relationship with this person. He is the one who reigns over us. Admittedly, this can be tricky imagery. Too often, earthly kings and leaders fall prey to their greed, power struggles, and their egos. They lead recklessly. They hurt people. They protect their own interests. In our world, we have far more examples of bad kings and leaders than good kings and leaders. This is true of the Bible as well, I think. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see time and time again, the people in power fail miserably. Even good people who rose to power fall prey to the trap that is power. They become greedy, they become dishonest, they cheat, they exploit, they steal. In today's scripture passage from Jeremiah, we find the people of Judah in the midst of exile. Invaded by Babylon, they watch as their temple is destroyed. They're confronted with political turmoil and famine and honestly mass deportations. And while yes, the Babylonians are certainly at fault, they were aggressive and land hungry and greedy and they invaded, The truth is, the struggle began before Babylon invaded. Judah's exile was partially their fault. Their leadership was flawed from the inside out. The shepherds of Judah, their kings, were corrupt. These shepherds were supposed to be responsible for their people. But instead, they scattered them. They exploited them for labor. They lost sight of God's will and favored their own. They worked and operated by the phrase, might is right. Today's scripture can be split into two parts. The first part is a condemnation. It reads, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doing, says the Lord. God's will is not division. God's will is not disunity. God wholly condemns the irresponsible and misguided shepherds of the past who misled God's people. Their downfall at the hands of the Babylonians was their punishment. And while God's condemnation of the office of king could have resulted in the role of kings and shepherds being eliminated altogether, God offered a better alternative to the people of Judah. So the second part of this prophecy is a message of hope. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall no longer fear or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. This prophecy assures us 
that the goal was never for the role of king to disappear altogether. However, this role will be replaced by a new body of trustworthy and responsible leaders. Ultimately, God is promising a new shepherd, and this shepherd will gather, not scatter. This shepherd will bring people back, not drive them away. This shepherd will lead from peace, not anxiety or ego. This shepherd will lead with grace and remind Judah of the intentions that God has had for humanity all along. As Christians, it's easy for us to look back at these words and imagine that the leader Jeremiah was referring to was Jesus. And while this was 600 years prior to Jesus and there are intermittent leaders in between, on Reign of Christ Sunday, acknowledging Jesus as a fulfillment of this prophecy and that hope makes sense. He shall reign as king. He shall deal wisely. He shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Israel will live in safety. For Christians, Jesus is the one who reigns over us, the one in whom we find our identities and our very beings. But what does it look like to live from this truth? What does it look like to dwell in this truth? If we believe what we proclaim we believe, that Christ is king, it should change the entire trajectory of our lives. And yet somehow, we still fall prey to pledging our allegiance to other things. We place our confidence in our own abilities, our accomplishments, our aptitudes, our personalities. We pledge our loyalty to our jobs, to our country, to our ideologies. We make idols of our finances, our beliefs, our relationship status, and our hopes and dreams. We declare with our lips that Christ is king, yet we live lives that often say otherwise. And this is tricky because I believe God cares deeply about the things I've listed above. God cares that these things are important to us. Our ideologies, our beliefs, our jobs, our successes, and our failures, if we're being honest, make up our identities, and they speak to who we are. These categories help us relate to other people. It's important to remember that while these things help us explain our identity, to God, these things do not define our identity. When we operate from a mindset that Jesus reigns over all, a singular identity takes precedence, that we are the chosen, beloved children of God. Jesus' ministry here on earth showed us how deeply precious we are to God, and through Jesus, we learn how to be in faithful relationship with God and with one another. However, we like to live out of our own chosen identities instead of our God-given identities. And this can cause problems. This can cause division. Consider this well-known analogy. You are holding a cup of coffee and someone bumps into you, causing the coffee to spill. Why did the coffee spill? Well, many of us would respond, because someone bumped me. But in reality, the answer is, the coffee spilled because that's what was in the cup. If there had been tea or water or milk or soda or any other liquid in the cup, that's what would have spilled out. When what we're holding on is our own identities, we rely on our own instincts and emotions to tell us how to behave. Instead of responding, we often react. A lot of times, what spills out of us is fear, uncertainty, anxiety, anger, bitterness. But when we're firmly rooted in Christ, we can follow more closely in his nature. The hope would be that if we're living like this, what continues to overflow is grace, forgiveness, peace, the love of Christ. If this is the type of life we wish to live, 
and I think it is, then abiding in the reign of Christ becomes greatly important. But what does it look like to abide in the reign of Christ, to live every day like we really believe Christ is king? There are three ways I think we accomplish this. Number one, we abide in the reign of Christ when we surrender our lives. I have trouble with the word surrender. I have trouble admitting that I might not be the best person to be in control of my life. But surrendering our lives means that we place priority on the teachings of Jesus in our day-to-day -day routines. We surrender our lives when we do our best to walk with him, especially when his will conflicts with our own. If Christ really is the king of my life, then I must let him reign in all parts of my life, not just the parts that I invite Jesus into, not just where it's convenient for me, but in all parts of my life. We must be willing to live our lives in the spirit of the gospel and mean the words that we pray when we proclaim Thy will be done. By consistently choosing to surrender things in our lives to Jesus, we show others that Jesus really is king. If we are willing to be inconvenienced by the needs of others or make decisions that aren't easy for us, it shows people that what we believe challenges us and changes us. Number two. We abide in the reign of Christ when we follow his commitment to service. Jesus serves as our ultimate reminder of how we are called to treat people. We follow a model of servant leadership, acknowledging that whatever we have done for the least of these, we have done for Jesus. Jesus wasn't the type of king that grabbed land to expand their empire. Jesus wasn't the type of king that enacted things that hurt people. We are called to be a people who reach out and embrace people. We are called to be a people who reach out and embrace the enemy, the stranger, the poor, the marginalized, and the forgotten of society. We are called to support one another in mission and in prayer. We are called to lay down our lives for others as Jesus laid down his life for us. When we live our lives in this way, we are declaring that we are not at the center of our own lives. And this selflessness displays the love and mission of Christ to those around us. Number three. We abide in the reign of Christ when we choose to be aware of the kingdom of God. There's no such thing as a king without a kingdom. Largely, the role of the king is to reign over their kingdom. And again, I would say we're pretty lucky that Jesus doesn't resemble a traditional king. And since Jesus doesn't resemble a traditional king, the kingdom of God does not look like a traditional kingdom. Different things matter in the kingdom of love. Love matters in the kingdom of God. Justice matters in the kingdom of God. In the words of Gerald Derry, the kingdom of God is a space. It exists in every home where parents and children love each other. It exists in every region and country that cares for its weak and vulnerable. It exists in every parish that reaches out to the needy. The kingdom of God is a time. It happens whenever someone feeds a hungry person or shelters a homeless person or shows care to a neglected person. It happens when we overturn an unjust law or correct an injustice or avert a war. It happens when people join in the struggle to overcome poverty, to erase ignorance, and to pass on the faith. 
The kingdom of God is in the past. We see it in the works and life of Jesus of Nazareth. It is also in the present, in the work of the church, and in the efforts of many, many others to create a world of goodness and justice. It is in the future and will reach its completion in ages to come. When we acknowledge that God's work and presence is a part of the past, the present, and the future, it allows us to continue with the assurance that God is in charge. God has been at work long before any of us were around, and God will be at work long after we are no longer. When we are alert to the actions of God, we can choose to join in. And when we choose to join in, we become grateful participants in the work of the kingdom of God. I want to be clear that we don't choose to recognize Christ as king simply because he makes us better people. That's behavior modification. No, we follow Jesus because he invites us to do so. And because he has proven over and over again that he is a trustworthy and gentle and loving king. The kind of king who lays down his very life for the people he loves. Charles Colson, former legal counsel to Richard Nixon, says this, all the kings and queens I have known in history sent their people out to die for them. I only know one king who decided to die for his people. We follow Jesus because he is worthy of being followed. Jesus does not lead us anywhere where Jesus himself was not willing to go. May this week be a joyous celebration of life in our church as we uncover what it means to more deeply abide in the reign of Christ, whose sacrificial love continues to give us new life. Amen. Thank you for listening to First Words. For more information about our services or how to get involved in our community, visit us at fumcflorence.org or facebook.com slash florencefumc.